So we're kicking off this series, and it's all about being authentic. 1 John is a really, really powerful epistle. And for a lot of people who don't know the Bible, um, there are four different books in the Bible that have the word John with it. You've got Big John, which is the Gospel of John, but then you've got three little, small, short letters at the end of the New Testament, and that's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And so we're going to be in that first one uh, towards the end. And like I said, we are talking all about authenticity. There really, through the book of 1 John, there are four marks of an authentic Christian. People who genuinely and truly follow God, John lists four characteristics of authentic Christianity, and he writes in a parallel. And so if you can think about it like this, there's really two columns that John deals with, living in the light and living as children of God. They're kind of synonymous, okay? And there are four characteristics of being a child of God or somebody who lives in the light. The first characteristic is somebody who renounces sin, And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. The second is somebody who obeys. The third is somebody who rejects worldliness. And the fourth is somebody who has faith and loves. Those are the four marks of authentic Christianity. And those are the four things that we should strive for. When I think about authentic Christianity, I think about the time when I traveled to New York City with my mom, 17 years old. And we would go to New York, really fun experience, always go during the cold winter months, you know, they have the Christmas tree and stuff like that. And, uh, and so we would always go down to Chinatown, and my mom liked to buy the knockoff purses, and I liked to buy the knockoff watches. And one specific time, I bought a knockoff Movado watch, all right? If you know anything about Movado, you know it's a really high-end brand. They're typically like 600, 700 bucks. Well, I wanted a Movado watch, and so you sneak into like their little back rooms after they figure out that you're not like a, you know, a cop or something like that. And so they have all these watches there, and they try to start you off really high, and you haggle them down as low as you can get them, and then granted you get a knockoff watch what's the problem the problem is it's a knockoff watch and so it only takes a few weeks after a little bit of wear and tear and it just stops working that's that's what knockoff watches do I can remember specifically buying it and my uncle Mark all right my dad he was a crazy guy he was really funny he was a social worker he impacted a lot of people and they were just really kind of like funny loud people and I, I you can tell I don't follow after them after them at all right but that's that's who they were my uncle Mark was a sweet talker all right he was a car salesman I mean the guy the guy just would flatter you you and you knew it. And you knew that he knew that you knew it. And so it just made it really awkward. And so he's trying to convince me that this Movada watch is real. And I know it's not real. I bought a knockoff in Chinatown. And I know that he knows it's not real. But yet, that's who my Uncle Mark was. He tried to convince me that this knockoff was a real thing. And that's what John talks about in 1 John, is he's going to talk about how there are certain worldly influences of people around us and our families and our friends on the media. I mean, there are so many influences that try to convince us that this is what Christianity looks like. But we know, John says, oh no, we know this is authentic Christianity, John is writing to a group of people who are obviously Christians. And the early church was made up of Gentile Christians. They really struggled with the humanity of Jesus because they came from this pluralistic background where they believed that these people, these gods, right, weren't human at all. And then you had Jewish Christians. And as you can imagine, what do you think the Jews struggled with? They really struggled with the deity of Jesus. And so you had these two different people groups from two different backgrounds, two different cultures coming together inside of one church and carrying their religious experiences and all of the garbage that they had from their previous beliefs into the church. And out of this group of people came another group. And it's this really big, fancy term. The Greek word just basically means knowledge. But it, it, they, they called themselves, or they were called Gnostics. Okay, They were called Gnostics. And they believed the flesh was evil and the spiritual was good. Anything that's physical is evil. Everything that's spiritual is good. And they claim to have special knowledge. You ever meet somebody like that, right? A know-it-all? They got special knowledge about the way things work, and they always try to one-up you in conversations, and they just know everything about everything. Well, these Gnostics, they believe that their special knowledge gave them the release of, of any sin. So anything that they actually committed in the body of sins weren't really sins. Why? Because they had special knowledge. And we actually have people like that in our culture today. Not just Eastern mysticism, like Buddhism and Hinduism. They believe that really the material things are just uh, an illusion. It's not actually real. And so if you want to break free from this cycle of materialism, you got to experience nirvana. You have to have special knowledge. Well, there are even other people today 
and the New Age, even atheists who claim that they have special knowledge and that gives them the real perspective on life. And yet here is John and he's, he's going to share with us in 1 John all about, look, Jesus is the real deal. We touched him, we ate with him, we heard him, we saw him, He is the light that was given to us by God. And if you claim to follow him, the first thing that you are going to do is you are going to renounce sin. But here was the problem with the Gnostics. Because they refused to recognize their sin, they refused to renounce their sin. I mean, if you can think of it like this, how do you renounce something that you don't have? It's like a sickness, right? How do you renounce a sickness or try to get treatment for it if you claim that you don't have it? Over the past summertime, around June, my physical body was absolutely wrecked. I mean, I could not get enough sleep. I was ridiculously tired. I have never felt more exhausted in my entire life. And Angel had just previously been diagnosed. She, she got mono. It's the kissing disease. So I'm like, how'd you get that, hon? How'd you get mono, huh? Well, we actually think Piper picked it up from somewhere. Piper had a fever earlier. Next thing you know, Angel gets a fever. And now I am feeling like, I'm like, holy cow, I, I feel like I'm dying. That's honestly how you feel. And so as a, as a grown man, of course, you don't go to the doctor, right? Because that's what grown men do. <laughs> and so I didn't go to the doctor for like four weeks. Well, there's really no treatment for mono. And so you have all of this self-justification in your mind why you can ignore your sickness. Well, sure enough, I go to the doctor. I found out I have mono. There's no treatment for it. But it was my so willful ignorance to recognize my sickness that prevented me from actually trying to make myself feel better. I was going out in the yard and doing yard work. I was only making it even worse. That's the same way it is with our sin, is that we can't have the characteristic of renouncing our sin if we're not willing to recognize our sin. Read along with me in 1 John, chapter 1, starting in verse 8. John had just said Jesus is the real deal, and look what he says. He says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and is just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And if we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So what John does here is he says, if this, if this, he does it four times. And the first point that he really hits on in verse 8 and verse 10 is this, if we claim to be without sin, or if we claim that we have not sinned, what he is saying is this, if you claim that you don't have a disposition towards sin, or you don't have a sinful nature, or you don't have this inclination towards sin, you're lying. You're not telling the truth. Simply simply put, sin is the departure from light. If you go on in chapter 3, John says sin is lawlessness. And I believe that we are born in this world and we are born without the inclination to sin. I don't think that we are born and our little children grow up and they have this idea that I'm going to sin and trespass against the holiness of God. I think we have a sinful culture that conditions our children based off of their, their instincts which are not sinful, and it just causes this idea of selfishness and rebellion. And so that's, that's my personal philosophy. And I actually think Romans 5, and we're not going to get into it this morning, but Romans 5 presents a very, very powerful argument that we are not born in original sin. We are born in original grace because the one act of Christ cancels out not only what happened with Adam, but can potentially cancel out our own sin as well. And so the whole point of Romans chapter 5 is, Jesus is much, much more than Adam. Took care of Adam's sin and could potentially take care of yours as well. But here's the deal. We have to recognize that authentic Christianity recognizes our own sin. Not sin in general, but sin as in me. I am a sinner. I am a person who sins. And what does John tell us to do? What is the attitude that we should have towards sin? He says, confess. Confess your sin. Recognize that this is a real issue. Let me ask you this morning, what is your attitude towards sin? When you think about your own self and your own life and your own sinful choices, what is your attitude towards your own sin? Do you ever find yourself trying to justify it or excuse it or make a really good reason why your sin's okay but the sin of the people around you isn't? You see, it's really easy, isn't it, to point out the sins of other people. 
I mean, we're good at that. Like professional criticism, that's what our culture is now. We're really good at looking at everyone else. We're saying that's wrong, they're wrong, that's wrong. But yet John really brings a strong point home here. He says this in verses 8 through 10, if we claim to be without sin, we are deceiving ourselves and we are lying. You see, first of all, he says in a positive sense, you're deceiving yourself. It's a deliberate refusal to face the facts. If you missed this morning, this morning we had Calvin, he came and he presented to us from the Samaritan Women Organization. This is an organization that uh, fights against sex trafficking, not only in our area, but also in the entire uh, nation. Uh, the, the sex trafficking industry is a $10 billion industry, he was able to share with us. The recruitment for sex trafficking starts at a very, very young age, uh, middle schoolers, even elementary age. I mean, it is a really big problem. It's an organization that we're going to support with our Fall Fest, and which, by the way, you guys are awesome. I mean, we've pretty much almost filled every single volunteer position for our Fall Fest. So you, I am so proud of you guys. You guys have absolutely rocked it out. And I'm really excited about this Fall Fest because we are going to get families who have never come here before. And they're going to get a chance to interact with us and have fun with us and eat with us. And we can invite them to church. I mean, think about this. Somebody comes up and knocks on your door and they say, hey, my name's so-and-so. Can I share my Lord and Savior Jesus with you? What's your, what's your reaction going to be? You're going to be like, look, I, I already go to church, right? You're going to close the door and you're not going to talk with them. I mean, come on. We don't approach life that way, right? And so what a great opportunity to have a fall fest where we can connect with people and we can share Jesus with them in a way that's not really off-putting and awkward. So anyways, fall fest, you guys did a really, really great job. But anyways, with the Samaritan woman, he was able to present to us the facts, here are the facts of sex trafficking. Here are the facts of the impact it has in our area. Here's what we can do to make a difference. And you know what's the amazing thing about facts? Is you can't argue with them. You can only ignore them. And that's what John is saying. If you say that you don't have sin, you're ignoring the facts. You're not facing reality. Have you ever told yourself a lie long enough that you started to believe it? When I went to um, New York, uh, the, one of the, it's probably like the third time I went, I traveled with my high school girlfriend, it, we were traveling in her vehicle, and my sister Abby. And so my mom did traveling medical work, and she had a, a hotel room, not really a hotel room, it was like a suite, right on the opposite side of New York City on the Hudson River. So it, it had a beautiful view. And back then in the high school days, right, you all know, uh, for some of you actually older than I am, and so you didn't even have any maps whatsoever other than the printed kind, but we had to do MapQuest. And MapQuest was a turn-by-turn -turn direction that you could print offline, and it was, it was a lot more helpful than trying to actually open up a map and read it. Now we have our phones. I do not know how we would survive without our phones. I'm like, blessed up, you know what I'm saying? Thank the Lord. So, so we got these directions, and I'm trying to find our way to my mom's place so that we can spend the weekend together. And so we're driving, and it, there are so, there's so, look, I'm from Ohio, okay? The, the biggest highway that we had was a two-laner with like three stoplights. And so I am really panicking. My girlfriend's panicking. My sister Abby is doing what she was raised to do, and that's, that's laugh when other people are panicking. Look, I was raised in a household. Your first response to the pain of others is to laugh. Uh, that's just how I was raised. And so I have to condition myself to be compassionate because when people fall and hurt themselves, I, I laugh. That's what, what I do. It's really messed up. We have, a, we have a sinful tendency, right? I recognize that. Uh, I'm confessing that to you. So anyway, so we're, having, we're on these directions. And of course, you know, I'm a man. And so I know which way we're going. And we're driving. And I could have sworn I was following the directions turn by turn, but apparently, apparently I turned down the wrong path. And next thing I know, we're going across the George Washington Bridge at rush hour. Okay, that's what the George Washington Bridge looks like at rush hour. My girlfriend starts crying, literally sobbing. I'm having a panic attack and uh, my sister's in the back laughing because that's what, you know, we were trained to do. And so here I am driving across the bridge, and I am in total, total scared mode. I actually literally stop. Of course, if you're in New York, what do people do when you stop, right? They hate you. And I'm like in the, in the farthest left-hand lane. I have to get over to the right lane, and it's like six lanes deep. It's just not good, okay? So I finally made it across the George Washington Bridge, but the whole time I denied that I was going the wrong way. And the two ladies with me kept telling me, Rick, you're going the wrong way. This isn't right. I'm like, nah, this is the right way. You just need to listen to me. I'm, I'm the guy here, right? And that's how sometimes we can approach sin, is that we just deny the reality that we have it or that we're struggling with it. And it's nothing but pride. For these Gnostics, it was, I have special knowledge, and I don't, sin really isn't that big of a deal. And that was the biggest mistake that they made, is they downplayed not just the seriousness of sin, 
but whether or not they actually had sin. And that is a fatal flaw that we can make. John says, if we don't understand and accept, and if we claim to be without sin, if we claim that we have not sinned, we are lying. That's what he says in verses 8 and 10. We deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. We make God out to be, look at this, a liar. And the truth is not in us. For the truth not to be in us, it was a way like if if you were to walk up to somebody and say, I have joy, right? It's describing the characteristic of joy. And for a person who claims to be without sin doesn't have the characteristic of being a truthful person. They're not telling the truth. And look, it's, it's not a very nice thing to call somebody a liar, is it? But yet, that's what John is saying here. Especially, look, in marriage, if you argue as if you're the one who never makes mistakes, good luck having a successful marriage. Right? I mean, if you go through life acting like you never make mistakes, good luck having a successful marriage. If you claim to be without sin, you're not being a truthful person. It takes two to tango. And when a relationship doesn't work, it's often because there's two people in there and not just one. That's how life works. And so John wants us to get rid of this idea that we want to cover up and hide our sin. No, instead, get it out to God. Confess it. Get it out in the open. Notice what he says in verse 9. That uh, In verse 9 he says, if we confess our sins, though, what happens? What happens when you're willing to recognize your sin and renounce your sin as a Christian? The Bible says he is faithful and is just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's what he says in verse 9. And so, basically, we could understand it like this. This, if we confess, has the force of a command. And we could read it like this. We ought to confess our sins, and if we do, God responds. Now, how do we know God's going to respond? Have you ever had your trust damaged? Have you ever confessed your sin, maybe to a spouse or to a parent, and you were hoping for grace and mercy and reconciliation, and instead all you got was judgment and condemnation and ostracism? Has that ever happened to you? And sometimes we project that onto God, especially if you have a bad relationship with your father. You tend to think God is like my dad. And so if if your father has abandoned you, you probably view God as somebody who's not going to be there. If your father's always come down hard on you, that's probably how you view God. That's, That's typically what I run into. And here's the deal. Sometimes we get so damaged in our trusting relationship with God that we don't trust that he's going to do what he promises to do. This is a promise to people who are Christians. If you give your life to God and you recognize that you're a sinner and you renounce your sin, first of all, he says, God is faithful. It means he keeps his promises. By nature, by nature, God is forgiving. God wants to forgive you. And if God promises, if you live a life renouncing and recognizing your sin, I will forgive you. You can take it to the bank. Why? Because God is faithful. He also says in this verse, God is just. You see, part of God's character is that God demands justiceness. He demands, he de- he demands righteousness. He demands justice. And by remaining true to his pr- promise of, uh, of forgiveness, even when we fail to keep our end of the bargain, God is always going to come through. Why? Because God is just. Have you ever promised God you weren't going to do something and you did it again? Oh yeah, I've been there. Have you ever thought that you would never go to do that something again to hurt the people around you and what happens the next week? You do it again. Look, when I became a Christian, I was so on fire for God the day that I got baptized. I was so excited about living a perfect life for the Lord. I thought God was just going to make me absolutely clean and I was never going to have any problems. And guess what happened the next day? I messed up. <laughs> Made a mistake. But yet God is just. Even when we don't keep our end of the bargain, God still promises to forgive. And man, I am so glad for that, and I hope that you are too. So God is faithful. God is just. He goes on to say this. When we acknowledge our sin, look what he says. God forgives us and purifies us from all unrighteousness. This word forgive is in the present tense verb. It means to release, to let go to free the debt. It means he constantly removes the guilt. I was going to show you a video, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to. But when I was um, a young guy, I grew up, you know, Michael Jordan, always, well, I don't even care about the facts. I'll just ignore them. MJ will always be the greatest basketball player that's ever lived. Uh, I watched MJ all the time. Carl Malone. I mean, I watched all of those guys. One of my favorite basketball players who was known for blocking shots was Dikembe Mutombo. I mean, the guy was this huge, lengthy guy with long arms. 
And after he would block a shot, he would always wave his finger and not in my house. That's what he would do. And so Geico came up with this hilarious commercial where uh, Dikembe basically runs around and just smacks stuff out of the air for people. And so this kid's trying to put cereal in the grocery cart and Dikembe comes around and he smacks it, not in my house. A guy's trying to throw a piece of paper in the trash can, Dikembe out of nowhere smacks it, not in my house. And then in this scene, this poor little lady, she's just trying to do her laundry. And of course, Dikembe comes around and he smacks it, not in my house. And that's exactly how it is with God. If we are a Christian who recognizes and renounces our sin, and when we fall short and we don't keep our end of the bargain, and that sin comes up to God, Jesus comes out of nowhere and he smacks it out of there and he says, not in my house. You're a part of my family now. Your sin doesn't reach God any longer because I'm here. That's the justice and the righteousness and the forgiveness of God. Your sin is no more. That's the promise. That's something that we should hold on to. And he goes on to say it, he purifies us. He purifies us. Think about that. It's not just a legal standing before God as being guilt-free, but he actually, through the act of confession, through recognizing and renouncing our sin, it partakes a purification in our own lives. The worst thing that you can do if you have a sin issue is to cover it up and hide it. You got a struggling marriage? Confess it to God. Confess it to some friends around you that you trust. You got a pornography issue? Confess it to God. Confess it to the people around you. Do you have a jealousy or a hatred issue? Do you have a sin issue? The worst thing that you can do is conceal it and cover it up because you're deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself. Get it out in the open. Give it to God. Verbalize that testimony. God, I am a sinner and I need you. And I confess this to you. I renounce my sin. I don't want to sin. God, help me. Help me follow you. When you verbalize that, it purifies your heart. It purifies your life. If you can think of of it like this, counseling is one of the greatest gifts that we've ever developed in the 21st century, and Christian counselors especially. I mean, I always refer people to Christian counseling. We're blessed to have uh, Dr. Mark Maggio uh, on staff, and he, is, uh, he has a doctor's degree in psychology, and so I always refer people to him for counseling because he's able to treat not just the mind, right, but also the soul, not just the body, but also the spirit. And it is a grave error in our 21st century to only treat sin issue with medicine. Medicine's a wonderful gift. And I always, look, I'm not on the opposite extreme. For Christians who renounce medication, I I think that they're in error, 100%. I'm not ashamed to say that. I think God has given us medicine for the ability to help our bodies when we have things that aren't working the right way. But the failure to treat the spirit is a grave, grave error. That is something that we must do. And so when you go to a counselor and you talk with them, what's their objective? They listen, you speak. Why is that? Why aren't they giving you a 35-minute lecture like we do on Sunday mornings? Because it's so important for you to verbalize and recognize your problem. Because if you can't verbalize it, if you can't recognize it, you can't renounce it. You'll never be able to solve it. And so that's the job of a good counselor, a good psychologist. It's not just to treat the body. Maybe there are things that are misfiring. You need to get medication to fix that. But most importantly, to treat the soul, to recognize where it is that you're going wrong. Identify the problem. Speak about the problem. It's like this, okay? You can't ignore the problem. I don't mind washing dishes. Angel, my wife, hates washing dishes. I hate laundry. Oh my goodness. I would rather just take a beating than to do laundry. I hate throwing it in the washer. I hate throwing it in the dryer. I hate folding. That's the worst part. It takes like an hour. I'm like, holy cow. Everything's got to get hung up and folded the right way. And then you got to take it and you got to put it away. I'm like, this is exhausting. I can get dishes done in like 10 minutes, but it's really dirty and nasty. Okay. Have you ever burnt a dish so bad (coughs) that you just want to throw it out? Not me, all right? I'm a scrubber. And so I get in there and I get out the knives and the forks and the spatulas and I'm getting in there and I'm scrubbing off that dish. I don't mind rubbing my hands and getting, getting them dirty. Angel, she's like, ooh, that's, that's gross, you know, like a lady. Ooh, I don't, want to, I don't want my hands in that. That's yucky. But she'll do laundry. And so I, it's a win-win for me, okay? A good extra transactional relationship right there. She's like, hey, I'll do the laundry if you do the dishes. And I'm like, works for me. <laughs> and then she's like, honey, will you help me out with the laundry? This was not part of the deal. <laughs> Donald Trump, this is the worst deal in human history, right? So 
Uh, why did I tell you that? No, I'm just kidding. I know why. So here's the deal. So you have, you have these dishes that need to be scrubbed. They need to be clean. And when we talk about our problem, that's what we're doing. We're scrubbing. We're washing. We're cleaning. We're not ignoring the issue. There are, I'll, I'll, I'll just straight up confess to you. There are some times that there's a dish that I don't want to clean, and I'll just ignore it, hoping it will clean itself right? Have you ever done that? No? There's been a dish that sat on my calendar for like a week before, all right? I'm just going to straight up be honest with you this morning. And if you say you haven't, you're either lying or you're really awesome, okay? There's only two issues. So uh, it was great. Look, that's how I was raised. When we would, when we would eat, like grandma and grandpa's house, this is how I was raised. Sometimes they would just let stuff sit out all night and get up and clean it in the morning. It's kind of gross now. I'm like, ooh, that's, that's weird. Like, my family's really weird. You ever reach that moment in your life where you're like, your family's really weird? Yeah? No? Just me? Okay, yeah, just me. So here's the deal, all right? God, if we're willing to recognize our dirtiness, God will never throw us away. If we are willing to get dirty and scrub and clean, we never become a dish that is just ignored off to the side, and the only thing that you can do after it gets so bad is just to let go of it, put it in the trash, get rid of it. God doesn't operate that way. He is willing to scrub us clean and purify us, to remove all that guck and all that dirt and all that nastiness. Why? Because God, by nature, wants to forgive us. He is just. He is forgiving. And so when you sin, God isn't going to throw you out. He's going to make you clean so you can be used again. And so if we remember that we are sinners, God remembers that we are righteous. Confessing our sin is a powerful act of recognition that sets the stage for authentic Christians to renounce our sin. And even though we mess up, we look at that and we say, man, that's not what I want to be. That's not who I want to be. That's not how I want to act. That's not what I want to do. That isn't what God is for. And even though I make mistakes, I'm not for that because I am for God. When you look at the Apostle Paul, for instance, one of, the, one of those powerful passages of Scripture about self-recognition, here is Paul writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy, one of the later letters that he wrote in his ministry. He had spent his previous life persecuting the church. He was known as Saul of Tarsus, threw people in jail, hunted families down. I mean, the guy really persecuted the church. But even after being an evangelist, an apostle, and baptizing uh, probably hundreds if not thousands of people into Christ throughout his ministry— Paul, in the latter point of his ministry, still recognized something very, very important. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came to, into the world to save sinners, of whom I was the worst. Is that what it says? Of whom I am the worst. He never lost his recognition that I sin, but also I am saved. His identity was a saint, but he never lost the reality that he was a sinner. Because the moment we lose that reality, we deceive ourselves, and we make God out to be a liar. And the question is why? Here's what the Gnostics did. The Gnostics says the standard doesn't apply to us because we have special knowledge. In fact, the standard doesn't even exist because we have special knowledge. The flesh is bad. The spirit is good, and the flesh doesn't matter anymore. And here's what they did to the standard of God. They threw it away. They made it obsolete. But yet here's God. He's saying, no, this is still wrong. Committing sins in the flesh is still wrong. And so who's right? The Gnostics? The people who reject the idea of God and say there's no moral values and duties in life? Or God? It's black or white on the sin issue. It's right or wrong. Either God is true or the Gnostics are true. Either God is a liar or the Gnostics are lying. And I don't know about you, but I'm on the side of God. I think God is telling the truth. And I think that I am a saint who is saved, but I'm also a sinner in need of salvation. Paul carried this guilt with him, and that's, that's probably where it could eventually lead, is to err on that side. Is sometimes when we recognize that we're sinners, it can create a guilt problem. Look at what Paul said. I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least of the saints. Not just talking about people elected, right, and voted in as saints. There's a universal sainthood in the Bible. And he says, out of all the Christians that I've ever known, I'm the least. All have fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, Paul never lost the reality that there is a sin problem in the church. And we can't either. Look at what John goes on to say in chapter 2. John says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. So I'm not encouraging you to go out and sin. He's saying the whole point of this recognition and renouncing issue is so that you will not sin. But look at this. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, 
the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. He says, my family. This isn't a derogatory term. He's not calling them, you know, ignorant children. He's saying, look, my children, the people that I've loved and discipled, you guys are part of my family. Even though you might be struggling with some of these doctrinal issues, you're still a part of my family. This is about intimacy and love. And look at why he's writing. I write this to you so that you will not sin. I want you to renounce sin. I want you to recognize the fact and the seriousness of sin. I want you to walk in the light. I want you to be children of God. But why did Jesus come? Not to do away with the fact that we struggle with sin, but to do away with the fact that we are sinners in the eyes of God. He forgives us and he purifies us. And so a key phrase that I would focus in on is this. While we can't avoid the fact of sin, we can avoid the practice of sin. And confession helps us recognize and resist sin in our lives. There is a difference between a person who is fighting for God and struggling against sin and a person who claims to follow God and practices sin as a lifestyle. It's just something that they do. And that's what John told the Gnostics. If you look at the earlier part of 1 John, he says, you are claiming to be without sin. You are claiming fellowship with God, but you're walking in darkness. You're practicing sinful things. You're not fighting against it. You're not struggling against it. You're not confessing it. You're giving into it. Why? We have special knowledge and the rules don't apply to us. And John says, oh no, walk in the light If you claim fellowship with God, you must obey and do what he says. That's what it means to have fellowship with him. And so he says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. I want you to renounce sin. I want to discourage you from sinning. But I want you to know this. When you mess up, when you don't keep your end of the bargain, when you fail to meet perfection, he says we have an advocate before the Father. And that is the best news that we could ever have. And of course, he's speaking to Christians here. If you, if you haven't given your life to Christ and you're not a Christian, you have to stand in God's court on your own accord with your own attorney, and that will be you. No one will be able to come alongside you. That's what this word advocate means. It's parakaleo. It means to come alongside. You could use it as a helper, somebody in aid, but it was often used in ancient times as a defense attorney. And what they would do is poor people, of course, they didn't have a lot of money. They weren't well educated. See what I did there? They weren't well educated, and so they really, they really, if they were to go to a court of law, even if they were, weren't guilty, right, because they lacked money, power, influence, and education, they would be found guilty. And so you had these parakaleos, these advocates that would charge them a small fee, and they would come alongside them in court, and they would speak to their defense, and they would offer up evidence that would be acceptable in a court of law. And of course, we know defense attorneys today, right? That's who Jesus is for us. Even when we mess up, if we're willing to recognize and renounce our sin, Jesus is like Dikembe Mutombo, boom, slaps the sin out, not in my house. That's who we have. Man, praise God, that is good news. You see, he's going to present his evidence in a court of law. And you know what that evidence is? Himself. Look what he says here in verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He's the offering. God, this person is not guilty. Put their guilt on me on the cross 2,000 years ago. And God says, I'm willing to accept that. You see, the blood of Jesus neutralizes the condemnation that sin imposes on us. But when God gives us his Holy Spirit, it can start to neutralize how sin imposes upon our personal spirits. Legal justification, but also purification before God. And so when God looks upon the sacrifice of his son Jesus, he chooses to view that as payment enough for the punishment that we deserve. And John paints this picture of Jesus standing alongside of us with the Father on the throne, and he is pleading on our behalf. And God takes his gavel, and he slams it down when he looks at you, and he says, not guilty. Good news. Why? Because of Jesus. But it's not just for our sins. The Bible says it's for the sins of the entire world. And so that can be yours too.